the domestic impact of World War One on Germany, podcast number five. Uh, this one is focusing on war aims, um, which uh, links uh, very much to the topic of polarisation, which will be the final uh, podcast. Um, brief explanation, putting this into context, um, without recapping on all of the previous podcasts, obviously one of the key trends, or one of the, the key um, points that has been made is the uh, way in which popular opinion changed um, between 1914 and 1918. You can't view the whole of that four-year period um, as a uniform whole. Uh, Bergfrieder at the beginning, increasingly um, the, 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 the civilian mood was divided um, from 1916 onwards. Um, and uh, as a way of dealing with that, a silent dictatorship was created that undermined Bettmann Holweg's political position. Um, now, in the previous podcast, we increasingly talked about how th that, that division, the popular mood, particularly the lower classes, there was increasing resentment against war profiteers, um, a, b a belief that the war was being fought um, by uh, was being extended uh, by the elites uh, for uh, for their own selfish interests that they were profiting from the war. Um, so this particular podcast uh, it, it gives more context to that because it talks it, it deals with the underlying issue of what type of society um, were Germans expecting to come into existence when the war ended? What was the purpose of the war? What was the, what would the future Germany look like? And of course, that very much was a divisive issue um, that underpins this whole uh, topic. So the key learning points: um, Why did Bettmann Holweg dodge, dodge, dodge the discussion on war aims? Uh, what were the two different war, a war aims that emerged in the second half of the war, and the groups that supported those um, opposing war aims, and the impact of the Russian defeat, what impact did that have on this situation? There's your supplementary reading uh, from William Carr. Make sure you read those pages carefully and make sure you supplement the class notes. Remember, the class notes are taken solely from Leighton, uh, which really only gives you access to the lower grades, grades C, D and E. To access A star, A and B, you really need to be um, uh, uh, consolidating your knowledge using William Carr. Okay, so there's Bettman Holweg. Um, key point. Bettman wanted to avoid any discussion during the war about what kind of Germany would prevail after the war. Okay, that he... He, he didn't want that to be a subject of conversation. Why? Because at the beginning of the war there was unity, there was political unity. The war united Germans. Once you start talking about what will Germany look like after the war has been won, then the German people will divide amongst themselves. The war has created that unity. Remember, before 1914 there was disunity. War has created unity. So he, he was very, very keen to avoid any discussion. He had his own views about uh, what kind of Germany he wanted, um, but he wanted to avoid any kind of discussion. So two different war aims, the two different war aims, what were they? Okay. Firstly, some people, those who believed that Germany was fighting a defensive war, believed that when the war ended, the peace treaty should be a compromise peace treaty. It should be based on open and honest discussion with the other side, with Britain and France and Russia, and that the purpose of the peace treaty should be no annexation. Now, annexation means Germany taking land from the, the, the other side. Um, this particular view was... No, we are fighting a, a defensive war, so if we win the war, it would be morally wrong to take territory from the losers. We mustn't do that. Okay. Now, understandably, that view was most strongly f expressed within the Social Democrats. The Social Democrats, of course, believe in the, break, the breaking down of international barriers, a future, uh, the, the op obviously the opposite of nationalism. Um, so they, the strong belief that uh, fighting a war to grab territory was morally wrong. Um, the picture there, Philip Scheidemann, we'll mention him more in future lessons, he was effectively like the number two within the Social Democrats after Hebert. 
um, and he was a, a strong uh, proponent of that particular point of view. The opposing point of view was that actually when Germany wins that war uh, we should be the, the peace treaty should be based on conquest. In other words, we win the war, we do not compromise, we do not be, take a reasonable slant, we have won the war, we must expand our frontiers, we must take territory uh, from the losing side. Um, that means basically we will take territory from France and from Belgium in the west, and we will take territory from Russia in the east. Okay, that basically the purpose of the war was to present an opportunity for Germany to dominate the continent, continent of Europe. Um, also, the strong belief that the war was uh, an opportunity once and for all to nip the problem of revolution in the bud. Remember uh, the, 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 the fear of the, the rising tide of the socialists uh, and the war had, was a distraction. It distracted the masses away from left-wing ideas. If we win the war and we grab territory and we expand our power, that effectively uh, it will increase popular support for right-wing political parties. So this view was most strongly expressed by the Pan-German League. Um, as, we, as we know, um, they were a right-wing pressure group um, who wanted to create a central, central African empire, that, and there's the point I made earlier, annex key industrial and military regions in the Low Countries, that's Belgium and northern France, and also extensive Russian territory in the east. Um, the Pan-German League, uh, remember, uh, was... Uh, uh, drew its support from the right-wing conservative groups, the industrial elites, the landowners, the Prussian junkers, um, very influential in the Pan-German League, but they also had a broad basis of support among the middle classes. Remember, before World War I, these groups, the reason they came into existence was to sell their message to the ordinary people as far down that social ladder as possible. They never really were able to sell their, those ideas to the workers, but they certainly increased their support amongst the middle classes. So it wasn't just an upper class, an elitist group. They did have mass support. Why? Because the middle classes were very, very afraid of socialist revolution. Um, so again, that notion of distracting the, 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 the people at the bottom of the pyramid away from socialist revolution would help protect the middle classes. So Bettmann's dilemma, okay, personally he was a believer in sea freedom, okay, this idea of a peace based on annexation and conquest. Um, we can see that in 1914, the, the, the famous September programme, a secret document which outlined when the war was won that Germany w would dominate Western Europe and Eastern Europe um, with annexation. Um, but he couldn't afford to make those his personal views uh, as government policy. He couldn't afford to do that. Why not? Because as a politician, he needed to maintain unity, and that meant he needed to keep the support of the Social Democrats. But that became increasingly difficult for him as the war progressed, polarisation started to happen increasingly, taking a middle-of-the-road stance, trying to keep both the Conservatives on the right and the Socialists on the left with him became increasingly difficult for him point we've already developed. Now in April 1917 the uh, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, the, the High Command, published their famous Kreuznach programme which re repeated that uh, the annexationist demands. Um, that's a hyperlink and if you go to that hyperlink go down to the paragraph beginning was so soon correct and it gives you a bit more information about that programme. Um, now Bettman trapped in the middle here, trying to court the Social Democrats. Um, uh, we've already developed that theme in the previous podcast. That is when he began to lose his credibility um, uh, with both sides, trapped it, very, very much trapped in the middle. Um, that situation became even more difficult for Bettman after the Tsar was overthrown in March 1917. Um, once that happened, um, we really start to see the sort of polarisation. The SPD, the Social Democrats, actually split, and we'll develop this theme more in a future lesson, 
um, the extreme left wing formed a breakaway party called the USPD, the Independent Social Democrats. Um, they pushed for a very, very rapid end to the war. Um, once you know, they had been you know, effectively taking the lead from, from the events uh, inside Russia. Um, centre politicians who, who had previously supported the annexation also moved further to the left, so even the Catholic Centre Party moved further to the left. So you can see that polarisation in the diagram here. Increasingly there's that shift in the middle of the Reichstag. Those to the right, the, the parties, the Conservative parties, support Siegfrieder, the parties on the left um, increasingly um, supporting a pe um, a, a, an early peace and a peace based on compromise. Um, so after the resignation of Bettman, there was political deadlock. Okay, basically the OHL refusing to compromise, Hindenburg and Ludovic sticking to their Kreuznach program. Absolutely, they want a peace treaty on their terms. Um, calls from the Reichstag for a peace without annexation were ignored by the OHL. Um, and then in 1918, the OHL formed their own political party, okay, um, called the Fatherland Party. It gave political expression to the Siegfried program, a, 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 a peace based on annexation. And the leader of that party was one of the um, senior um, generals, uh, von Tirpitz, who we've looked at on several occasions. Um, uh, lots of backing from big industry, okay, for example, CAP, very influential, um, and by the end of 1918 it had 1.2 million members. So society increasingly mobilised around this whole issue of what type of peace as we move towards the middle of 1918. That's the end of this particular podcast. Thank you.